we look at the cognitive as the uh, the caboose on the train, you know, on the experiential train, and uh, and sometimes the co- and the cognitive sits back and kind of observes, and then the cognitive may offer something at at the end of the process, you know, or the cognitive may th- have no need to do that and just kind of stays offline. Hello and welcome. My name is Vincent Ryan. I'm a psychotherapist based in Ireland and um, today's interview is a part of a series of interviews we're doing with uh, practitioners of experiential forms of psychotherapy. So in this series we interview a wide variety of experiential therapists. So it's a compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential schools. So then without further ado, um, just a little bit bit about our guest today. So we have David Grand, PhD. Uh, he's the founder and developer of the brain spotting modality, including the recently revealed neuro experiential model. So David is the author of brain spotting, the revolutionary new therapy for rapid and effective change. And he has a psychotherapy uh, and performance practice in Manhattan, New York, and he is an internationally acclaimed lecturer. So David, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much, Vincent, for having me. Great. So maybe we could um, just begin by kind of talking about what we had a couple of emails about, which is, you know, the the idea of a therapy being more experiential or kind of experientially grounded than, say, perhaps what we might traditionally think of as a more cognitive therapy or a more talk therapy. Could you say a little bit about how you might conceptualize your own form of therapy, um, the brain spotting approach? And is that which how do you think about it in terms of experiential therapies? Uh, well, I'll start by saying um, the basis of brain spotting is the uncertainty principle, which is derived from neurobiology and the fact there's not too many facts that we know of in, in therapeutic uh, theory and practice, but it is a fact that the human nervous system has between one to four quadrillion synaptic connections. Very hard to wrap your mind around what a quadrillion is. But it, it's if you multiply a billion by a million, you get a quadrillion. So there's one to four uh, uh, quadrillion synaptic connections in the nervous system. Simple mathematics tells us that is an unquantifiable number. Okay, that is that's that level of complexity to a system is beyond knowable uh, in in any way. So the idea that when you sit in front of another person and they sit in front of you, that you can really know what's going on inside of them uh, is, is a mathematical and a scientific impossibility, which puts the therapist in a position of having to receive 100% of their information from the client, from what the client uh, expresses verbally and also what comes across uh, you know, non-verbally. Um, and in the context of the uncertainty principle, the therapist can do nothing other than follow the client wherever they go. Okay. To me, that's essentially um, ex- exper- uh, an experiential process. Um, that it's not just that we're not coming from a cognitive point of view, which we're not, but it's that we're coming from uh, a, a, a position of complete openness to the other person uh, not just for who they are, but from where they come from, where they are, and really, and, and where they go in the process. Uh, that leaves a tremendous open space for the therapist, which, which many therapists struggle with. You know, therapists uh, like to hold on to the side of the pool instead of let go and, and, and see what happens if they uh, take the risk of floating. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, brain spotting is frame-based. Okay, and the frame in brain spotting is called the dual attunement frame. The primary frame is the relational frame. Okay, so uh, even though brain spotting is is body based and brain based and mindfulness based, it's essentially relationship based, which you don't find for for most uh, 
neurotechnical sort of uh, therapies. But the primary frame in the dual attunement frame is the relational frame. Okay, so we acknowledge, we embrace that it is the relationship that is that is the grounding place for, for the healing for the person who comes to see us. And only superimposed on that is the, the neurobiological frame in brain spotting, which uh, takes into account um, uh, awareness of body activation and also body groundedness, but also relevant eye positions. So this is the technical part of brain spotting. Uh, we go by the concept that where you look affects how you feel. So that there are many eye positions for a person who's activated and aware of the body activation that hold relevance to that activation in the nervous system. And we find it in a, a variety of ways. But once we find, find that eye position, we use a, a pointer, we have the client just continue to gaze at that spot and mindfully observe their internal process and follow it where, wherever they go and occasionally report back to us where, where they go. And we follow the client wherever they go. Okay. And just my last, I'm, I'm covering a lot of territory, but, but the last thing I want to say is that we say in brain spotting that in the face of uncertainty, all we have is the frame. The frame is this dual attunement frame. Um, so that, Everything else is completely open, you know, not because we recognize it as such, but because it is open. So literally, we receive the client uh, and hold this dual attunement frame with them. We don't hold it for them; we hold it with them, and and that helps a certain kind of focusing inside of that frame. That means that the mindfulness process that happens from there is more focused than it would be without that. And wherever it goes is where it goes. And we never know where it's going to go until it gets there. And then it just goes beyond that. So then my question for you there, um, David, is what would that look like in practice if I was to come to see you, um, the relational piece? What, what, what might we be seeing um, in terms of the experiential side of that? What, what's that kind of, it, it may be you're thinking, if you're thinking of a client you've seen recently or how, how that might look experientially, do you think? Yeah. It's just two people sitting together in a room, you know, and uh, therapy tends to have a, uh, a, a power quotient where the therapist is, has, has more power and agency than, than the client. Okay. When it's two people sitting together in a room, it really should be equal, should be co-equal. But when the client has the information, you know, and the therapist doesn't have the information. In truth, it shifts that power quotient like this, which is really important for people who come to therapy because they're suffering. There's a trauma basis to it. So, so in that context, um, uh, uh, the client is able to, instead of being in a one-down position, be in a one-up position. And instead of having to go into compliance mode to the therapist and the, ther and the therapy, actually uh, is, is empowered by, by the process. Um, uh, but going back to your, to your question, uh, essentially it's two people together in the room, just two human beings, two, two nervous systems, two histories, two spirits. And uh, the only difference is that one needs the other to, to get some help with something they haven't been able to work out on their own. And the therapist has the potential of, of not providing it for the client, but for, for helping to frame things in such a way that, that the client's system finds, finds it on its own. And, and, it, and it goes from there. Um, uh, the, you know, in different therapies, they, the, there's, there's an idea that you can only work on certain things and certain things you can't work on. Or things have to be conceptualized and articulated in such a way for the therapy to work. In brain spotting, it that doesn't exist on on any level. Whatever brings the brings the client in, whatever the client brings in, is what we work on with them. And um, they may not be able to uh, to articulate it. You know, it may be something that's just somatic, or, or emotional, or uh, felt sense. But whatever that is, that's that's what we that's what we receive, and that's what what we work with. 
So the client in no way has to fit in with us or our model or models. It's for us to be there with the client and and uh, to bring whatever technical and, and um, wisdom and, and experience we have that will meet the client for, for where, where they are and, and where they need to be. Um, uh, and there are some client situations where a client comes in, can't articulate it, but they are activated around it and we process it to where the activation drops or sometimes re releases. And even at the end, the client can't articulate it, you know, but the client knows that they feel better, that they've gotten some or a lot of, of what they need. And, and, and that's more than enough. And to me, that's, that's extremely experiential. To me, that's essentially experiential. Absolutely. There's a felt sense shift. A person, if you ask them, do they feel better? They know because they feel it in their body, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't even have to really figure out what the question means, I think is what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. we've, had, we've had clients say after a session, I have absolutely no idea what happened, but I know I feel better. Yeah, and that's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, that the not needing to know maybe the cognitive piece even is essential to feeling better, actually, in a way. Yeah, we look at the cognitive as the uh, the caboose on the train, you know, on the experiential train, and uh, and sometimes the co and the cognitive sits back and kind of observes, and then the cognitive may offer something at at the end of the process, you know, or the cognitive may th have no need to do that and just kind of stays offline. Both are both are possible, but I suppose that's the mindfulness piece you mentioned as well about your your kind of inviting the person to have a certain kind of maybe observational or non-judgment perspective on what's unfolding perhaps is kind of, mm -hmm. is that kind of maybe what we're open, curious, and trusting about their process. Yeah. Yeah. Both for the, we, we support the client to find their way in, in that manner. And we let the client know we're following them in that manner. And then, then we have to manifest that. You know, this is a this is obviously a journey for you, David, around, you know, um, I, I suppose I've watched a, a couple of interviews you've done before, and I'm, I'm curious about this as well. Like you, you kind of discovered this way of working, you kind of moved into it from other kinds of ways of working. Would you like to say a little bit about how you kind of moved into these these kind of discoveries and modalities? Well, my first training was psychodynamic, psychoanalytic, um, which which is is two bodies of knowledge. One is the, the theoretical and one is the practical. And and the practical can actually stand on its own without the theoretical. You know, the whole idea of, uh, of uh, uh, the Oedipus complex, uh, and, and, uh, it ego, superego, and, and so on, um, are, it, 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 it's sort of a theory base, but the practice is you sit with the client and you encourage them to freely associate and then you follow them wherever they go. Um, the, and again, different analytic models uh, follow this differently. But there, the, the client is supposed to verbally express what's going on inside of them as it happens, which makes it um, a little bit less mindful. You know, I, I think different analysts do it differently. But that piece is essential to to the you know to the open um, mindful piece of brain spotting and. And it was in, in an analysis, uh, they say that the stance of the analyst should be evenly hovering attention, okay? Which is kind of like, you know, how we sit back, you know, in, in, in uncertainty with brain spotting. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do the piece of, of, of that level of uh, abstinence of interaction with the client that's prescribed in, in psychoanalysis. I'm just a, a more interactive kind of person. And uh, so I, sort of evolved uh, uh, the inside approach into a more relational kind of approach. Um, and, uh, you know, studying different things here and there. Um, uh, but it wasn't until the, uh, uh, the early 90s that I was exposed to uh, first EMDR and then somatic experiencing, um, which gave me more of a trauma and dissociation basis and gave me more of, of a, uh, a brain body basis. Um, but what I found, uh, especially in EMDR, was that there was a uh, rigidification of how human beings are looked at and interacted with. Uh, so uh, 
the power of EMDR was mitigated by the by the prescribed na nature the uh, uh, prescribed nature of of how you do it. Uh, when they talk about protocols and procedures, um, that never worked for me. Um, I found myself just not doing them, or just or modifying them, and uh, uh, you know, so you know, I took what what worked and I let go of the rest of it, which the leaders of EMDR would say is not EMDR, which to me is an absurd absurd kind of philosophy. It's like uh, the idea is is not the ritualized following of a model. The idea is providing the best healing opportunity for the client in the moment. Um, uh, somatic experience really gave me much more of a, of a body awareness and, and awareness of body processes, but also of, of slowing things down and the need to uh, to be able to find and access and maintain a, a sense of groundedness in, in the body, in the body systems. Um, um, uh, you know, so so that I felt more more comfortable with. Um, but so I took from you know the the analytic and then the relational and then the EMDR and somatic experiencing. And each time I, I just took it into myself. Uh, I realized uh, in my evolution that it wasn't for me to do it anybody else's way. It was for me to find my own way of doing it, which when we do brain spotting trainings, we tell the trainees, um, don't try to do it our way. Find your own way of doing this, which again is what we're talking about here. Um, um, because a a step-by-step a, a -step model is not experiential. It's not in the moment. It doesn't breathe. It doesn't resonate. Um, so um, by the time I discovered brain spotting uh, in 2003, I had gone through uh, many different uh, iterations of, of, of how to sit with and help human beings to, to heal. So what what came from that was not only that I, I had this experience with this ice skater who, whose eye just wobbled and froze right on a spot and processed intent, intensely for 10 minutes in a way I'd never seen before and actually eradicated the block, the performance block that she had, you know, discovered it when she went to practice on the ice the next morning. But it gave me an opportunity to start to set my own frame for how healing should be done, both from the, the technical and also from the, uh, uh, the philosophical. Uh, so uh, in, in developing my own model and then developing the trainings for, for the model, which pretty much are intact for, for how they're taught now, even though the pre preliminary trainings are taught by others, um, uh, the training is, is experiential. Uh, we have, when we do the PowerPoint, we have not only written words, but we have pictures on each PowerPoint slide. And the written words are not, it doesn't, you know, there's no slides that are filled with with dialogue, so to speak. Um, it's just a, a, a sentence or two. And then there's the picture, which uh, is meant to give the, the attendee sort of a, a, a deeper brain experience of, of what that particular slide is, is, is teaching. Um, so, so for, so, um, in my own evolution and, and discovering my own model, developing my own model, it gave me a chance to take away everything that I found to be prescriptive in, in the models and, and how the models are taught. And there's some, some of the attendees are challenged by this because they're looking for, uh, tangibility. They're looking for predictability. And the basic thing we're teaching them is that human experience and, and the healing relationship is not tan tangible nor predictable. So anyhow, I know I, I went on a bit uh, from, from the question, but, uh, but, but that's been my evolution, you know. And, and, and I, I do have to add, um, brain spotting is evolving all the time. Okay, I'm changing it all the time, not because I need to change it or it should be changed, it's because that's the way it is. Um, so, uh, so brain spotting in 2022 is really quite different than it was in 2015, which was quite different than it was in 2010 and going back to the original point of discovery. And now there's so many experts and leaders in brain spotting that they are infusing 
you know, this evolution um, with with wisdom and ideas that would never come from me because I don't have it. But it, but it, it's an open, organic model, and that's and that's that's how it continues, in, you know, uh, to this day and into the future. I really like what you're saying there, <clears throat> because um, yeah, I mean, how can we possibly have the definitive model, you know, at any time, um, of, of you know, of our lives? Kind of okay, I figured it out now, so I'm just going to do this for the next twenty years with my clients. It seems a little rigid to me, <laughs> you know, so. Um, I can really sort of um, resonate with what you're saying there for sure. And I've heard other therapists talk to talk about difficulties with very rigid processes, like, you know, if EMDR is delivered in a very rigid way, the relational piece and the, as you say, the receptivity to what's happening in the client in the moment can get lost, I suppose. And that's perhaps, you know, if we're just following a protocol very, you know, sort of didactically or whatever. Well, well, in, in, in in many models the relationship is is never mentioned Mm. relational model obviously it's what it's grounded in but in many models relationship isn't isn't mentioned and when a relational therapist integrates the model into into what they're doing they make it relational but in but in, in essence they have to graft the relational onto the model instead of in in we're in brain spotting the the model is built on the if we go back to that sort of key moment when you were working with the ice skater, it seems I know like um, many therapists talk about these kind of defining moments with a, with a client where something happens and they discover a kind of a real insight. I think Shapiro with EMDR, she talks about kind of happening upon the eye movement that somehow shifted something for her. Yeah, that was the, her walk in the park. Yeah, her walk in the park. And I get the sense that this um, ice skater client really gave you a door into something about um, receptivity to her in the moment, something about noticing how her eye got fixed on something. Could you, uh, you know, expand that a bit about like what what you what you think happened, and looking back, what you kind of make sense of that, how you make sense of that now as a, as a therapist, maybe with more kind of time to digest that. Um, well, uh, Vincent, I'm going to really expand that because it wasn't that moment. It was everything that led up to it. But again, that was 2003. Uh, 2001 was the uh, attack on the World Trade Center. And um, uh, in the year, in the two years after t- between 2001 and 2003, I worked with hundreds and hundreds of 9-11 survivors, including people in the building first responders, firefighters, uh, law enforcement, people around the buildings, and and people who had uh, lost family members and friends to those in the buildings. And I had seen things in in, in doing healing work with, with just these countless people that I had never seen before. It was like a game, it was like a, a neurobiological game changer, or I should say a neuro experiential game changer, because that's our language now, brain spotting. And that just like opened me up to what what else is there? And it wasn't like I actually thought that. It was I just experienced that. So when I was sitting there with that ice skater, really two years after 9-11, um, uh, my being open and sensitized was part of, of maybe not even just noticing what happened with her, but even just the space that I was holding with her. There was a... a, a it was a greater uh, option of, of possibility that existed in how I was sitting with her. That's, that's, that's to expand it going backward in time. But it's not, but that moment of discovery for me uh, just was, you know, a door that I walked through. Um, because what I was struck by, what I was wrestling with after this, this session was I thought it was a breakthrough. Okay. I thought I stumbled onto something, but I was afraid to even think that, let alone say that, because like, what if I'm wrong? You know, it was, it, there was sort of a, an awesomeness to it for me. So, so from there, it was a matter of, of, of beginning to explore, is this really what I think it is? You know, what I'm afraid to, uh, to, to, to say that it was. 
And so I started to experiment with every other client, you know, looking for different reflexes in, in the eyes, eye, you know, eye processing anomalies or reflexes in the face and so on. And every time I would stop there and see what would happen. And I was, I was successful in what I was doing beforehand. So it wasn't like I was looking for something to do it better, although I always was, but not as specific as this. But it, I saw things happen that with not every client, but most clients that weren't happening before. And most of all, they gave me that feedback. And then also I started, because I have a lot of therapists in my, in my practice, did back then, and I still do. You know, I start, I, I wouldn't tell them what I, what I was doing. I would just do it. And then I'd say, just, just, you know, I noticed something in, in your eyes, just follow the spot. And, and then I got their feedback, but then they, they started to try it out with their clients. So in the course of like, you know, a, 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 a month or a few months, the feedback that I got and the, uh, directly from the people I work with and the feedback from the therapists who are trying with clients um, was, you know, was, uh, it, it was, so when I say it wasn't just that moment of, of, of discovery, but it was really in, in, in the, the weeks, days, weeks, and months after that, that was projecting forward towards, yes, this really is something. I don't know what it is, you know, uh, but, but we're getting some, uh, rep replicability. Um, uh, but it was never, and I never had a sense of, of, wow, I made a discovery or now I have ownership of something like this. It's really, you know, it always felt so, so much bigger than myself, so much beyond me. And as I sit here and talk with you, it still does. Yeah, maybe you could kind of, um, could you give us like um, another, like a, another sense of like, you know, like a client that, you know, you were, you were, you were meeting for the first time or you were meeting, if you could think of somebody, obviously disguise, the details, you know, we want confidentiality. Is there somebody that kind of pops into your mind, David, that's kind of like, yeah, you know, I saw somebody a few weeks ago or a few months ago and they came in and, and I just, it just, it just, I was receptive to them the, in the frame. It kind of became, it, it emerged that they were fixing in on something and it was, and, and how you, how you might've kind of worked with that. Would you have somebody or, or a session in mind with that? I'm thinking of a a person. Actually, it could be a few people who were exposed to a uh, man-made disaster, uh, without being any more specific to that. And uh, this person came into my office because they were, you know, it it it, it was actually a few years after, and this person was still highly symptomatic from it. And and when they came in. And I asked them just to tell me why they were, why they were there and, you know, were they, what they were experiencing. Notice first the client's eyes went like this, and then the client went like this, okay, as they were talking about it. And then they'd finish talking, they'd come back to me. Same thing happened over, over and over again. Okay. In, in brain spotting, we call this a gaze spot. It's a spontaneous spot. And um, so finally I, I said, okay, I want you to go back to that moment when everything went from everything's okay to everything's desperately not okay. I want you to go back to that moment. And the client not only moved their eyes, not only moved their head, I did a full orientation like this, okay? Like they were right back there, seeing it happen, okay? And then the client started to go into spontaneous processing, deep spontaneous processing. From that moment, all the way through, you know, the next few hours, you know, right like this. You know, and then they came, they came back to me, you know, and sort of illustrated it. And then I said, okay, so where are you at now? And they said where they were two hours later. Okay, just bring that up, notice what you feel in your body. It went right back like this. They processed then like a 24 hour cycle. You know, but I didn't have to use the pointer. I didn't look for eye positions. You know, it was so organic for that person to have a full visual um, head and neck torso orientation towards that spot. Um, what struck me about this as it was going on is that 
if I if this was happening with a therapist who didn't have my background and knowledge and experience, they would have never noticed that. They might have even thought that that the client was avoiding eye contact with them. The client was even t- need to turn away from them, go back to an old uh, resistance misinterpretation. Um, but uh, but because I knew what it was, you know, and that's that's a big part of the experiential. It's it's if we know something, the client is experiencing experiencing it, and we know it. They they experience us experiencing them. Okay, without without words, it's just it's just present in the room. It's 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 an energic. Um, but uh, when after just the processing, which went for the first hour, the first few hours, and the first day, and then the first week, and the first couple of months. When I brought the client back to that first moment when everything went from okay to desperately not okay, um, we just had a totally different experience. Of it. it wasn't as as if it hadn't happened, but it, it but it went from this is terrible to this was terrible, and. Um, and all of the sensory aspect of it was, you know, uh, sort of more spacious. But at, but at the same time, the things that were dissociated, because in that first in the first hours and day and weeks and so on, there was a lot of thing that a lot of things that the person had forgotten, had lost contact with. And in their processing, not only did did the things that the flashback things that were in their face just sort of go back. The things that they had lost sort of came back to them, so you had you had things moving, moving away and moving towards them. So you, you had this sort of uh, more accurate, coherent narrative that just sort of presented itself. But the whole thing happened without me giving that person one piece of guidance, except for go to that first moment. That was the only thing. I didn't ask any questions. I didn't do any interventions, and it all came out of that that orientation and that 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 person made. Um, uh, and, and again, I, I always say this goes on in every session with every therapist around the world. The only thing is to just don't consciously notice it and harness it. Um, but it, it, it just illustrates that the potential for healing was inside of that person and that I didn't have to do very much. Let me change that. I did a lot, but it was but through my presence. Yeah, that was the word I was thinking of, David. Uh, The word presence was in my mind just before you said it, actually. It's interesting that that's the word you used. That actually, yeah, the therapist's presence is enormously healing um, if a a person can be witnessed in a a fragile place um, that they need to to do something with that's difficult, right? Uh, To do Mm -hmm. on their own, I imagine. And one of the hallmarks of of, of a traumatic experience is isolation, this connection. Whether it's literally that you're by yourself or whether it's you're in a crowd of people, but what you're going through, nobody else knows about. You know? And by witnessing, you know, it, it's the first step out of that isolation towards reconnection with, the, with others and reconnection with, with oneself. Yeah, and what I'm really struck by is no, you knowing what to look out for. You know, you saw the marker, so to speak. Um, you saw the, the the fixed eye gaze, and a lot, as you say, like a lot of therapists would would just not see that. They would just all, virtually all therapists would not see yeah, that. I'm, I'm sure, and, and me included, I think. Well, not not going forth from 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 here, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll be certainly like looking much more into this um, and possibly the training as well. It looks really excellent to me. Yeah. I, I do want to mention that in brain spotting, nothing is proprietary. In other words, what I just said to you, you know, it's like you don't have to come to the training just to, just to observe that and make use of that. In fact, I would, I would want anybody who I share this with to be curious about and make use of it. Um, so we're not looking for everybody, all therapists to, to come and get trained in brain spotting. We're looking for the ideas that we have to get out into the mainstream of psychotherapy so that people can uh, can become more curious and informed about it and 
and make use of it however they do. We had another uh, person interviewed here a few weeks ago, um, and he was saying the same thing about, you know, um, EMDR that, you know, he would kind of adapt it to each person um, that we, and I know for myself and the different modalities I use, it's always a little bit original with each person because you don't want to be formulaic and it feels kind of clunky then it, it it's it's going to disrupt the relational if it's like if the person feels like you're just going through a thing that you know but that you're putting them through it i suppose or whatever yeah and in brain spotting we call that inorganic yeah and the goal is is to have the process be as organic as possible so the other question I had in mind was around less kind of shock traumas. Like, so that, that was an example of a shock trauma by the sounds of it, um, that, 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 that client. And I'm wondering, like, do you think about this in terms of shock trauma and relational trauma, like capital T traumas, you know, single events that maybe the person gets frozen on? What about more relational trauma that's more attachment based? Do you kind of, do you see a kind of a difference in how that works in terms of the brain spotting? The reason the answer to that question is no is because of the uncertainty principle. Right. Because if that even presupposes that there is a difference, and then the therapist then goes in with that mindset, and now the the the, the spectrum of possibility is narrowed instead of uh, expanded. Uh, but to, to be a little bit more diagnostic, uh, every trauma is a re-traumatization going back to the original pre-verbal traumas, birth traumas, intrauterine traumas, generational traumas. So there is no such thing as a single event trauma. Um, looking at it systemically, looking at it, you know, organically. Um, and and what we find with the, uh, the processing therapies is, you know, um, is that a person can come in for a single event trauma and, um, you know, Earlier issues can re can open or reopen, uh, and uh, um, a lot of it has an attachment basis to it. Um, uh, the, what I have found in my clinical work is that the more uh, early repeated developmental trauma there is, the more attachment uh, issues there are, um, and. I've just, I've made a lot of discoveries. I mean, I'm, I'm discovering things that other people already know. So, what kind of discovery is that? But, 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 my my, my laboratory is my uh, is is my office. So that's where I find out things that I never found out in trainings or books or you know research and so on. Um, but the prevalence of attachment issues um, has struck me. You know, as as I've gone ahead, I, it's not like I was uh, underestimating it, but but now it's it's greater than than, than I thought it was. Um, and and if if you look at it just sequentially, these attachment traumas happen before a lot of the the abuse. You know that that people experience. You know when they're three or five or or whatever. Uh, so so somehow, it, is it is it just that there's you know, that the circumstances that left the person to be exposed to uh, trauma and abuse uh, was sort of th there from the beginning. And, and, and that's where the derivation of the attachment um, uh, issues start. Or is it that, um, that, that, that attachment can be, you know, um, shaken by events that happen later on? You know, we, we, as developmentalists, we tend to, to look at it sequentially, but I'm always open to, to other possibilities. I, I do want to just throw this in um, uh, now because uh, it, it's relevant when we talk about issues of attachment or dissociation and so on. Um, uh, we in brain spotting object to the use of the word disorder as part of the diagnostic nomenclature. Okay. Um, an attachment disorder. If someone, if a, if a new life is is not received in the way that it it needs to be and should be, and is received in a chaotic sort of way, or an abandoning sort of way, all the the manifestations that come from there are not disorders. Mm. 
They're the natural reaction patterns that people have. And to call something a, a, a dissociative disorder or a dissociative identity disorder is talking about a survival and an and instinctual intuitive survival mechanism that, that human beings have to be able to somehow face the, the, the unfaceable and continue to go on and continue to function, to call that a disorder, for someone's nervous system to be able to divide itself up, to be able to, to, to maintain some sort of survival homeostasis, is not a disorder, you know? So, um, and, and that makes a big difference with, with how you sit with people and how you work with people. Because, you, you know, it just leaves you to to be aware of their capacity to survive and adapt and and uh, and prevail. Uh, uh, it's not like you try to look at their strengths. It's just it just com comes naturally when when you look at things that way. Yeah, no, I really 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 resonate with that. I suppose in terms of it's always adaptation, um, and if the circumstances are adverse, it's just it's. It's not necessarily it's not disordered insofar as it's the person surviving and from an outsider it might look like okay this person's not doing so well and they may feel like they're suffering a lot but actually it's their best effort to adapt and survive in that in those circumstances would that be kind of fair to say that's that sure. person's kind sure. of creative and heroic perhaps best effort like yeah 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 and uh and for, for people who ultimately make it to our offices, uh, they have a capacity to to survive and prevail that goes beyond most people. You know, um, uh, and it's not just, well, we have to look at the person's strengths as well as their weaknesses. As a matter, we have to truly appreciate the strength that this person is manifesting and to try to understand that which is problematic for them about it in in that in that context through that lens absolutely and i suppose that makes me kind of think of the next question around perhaps it's the counter transference of the therapist is sometimes part of the problem if it's a reaction to the person's adaptation um you know in terms of like okay i gotta figure this out because there's something about this that is you know hard for me to you know to process um if you kind of get what I'm saying, the the, the counter transference side of the experience, like the, the, the therapist's experiential field, um, maybe you know how would you how would you view that? Well, Freud came up with the concept of transference and then counter counter transference, and uh, and uh, his concept of counter transference is that it's ubiquitous, that it's primarily unconscious, okay. and and I think he was right on target with that. Um, uh, we've evolved in brain spotting to call it limbic countertransference, uh, to make it, to, to give a neurological you know, perspective on it, that the exposure to the client's traumas, um, not just direct and spoken, but indirect and, and held somatically, and resonating somatically, um, affect us every session with the client. And for the most part, it affects us in ways that we don't recognize. It's natural, and and that it activates in us the uh, the different responses to threat of uh, flight and freeze and fight and all the di the different kinds of, of reaction patterns. Um, so that the key thing is for us to just be aware of it, you know? and this is when it doesn't even hit directly on something that's happened to us, like a bad car accident or something. Um, but all, you know, all of our developmental traumas and all of our pre-verbal traumas uh, uh, will, will resonate with whatever the person brings into the room. Um, but we also look at it from a, a positivistic point of view that it's that the more we're aware of this within ourselves, the more it can support our empathy for, for the person in front of us, or the person with us. Um, uh, but... But if you think, well, am I having counter-transference or not? You're, you're kind of missing it. You know, of course, of course you are. Your limbic system is is tuned to be able to pick up on potential threat 
and to send the system into a uh, into a survival reaction pattern. You know? um, and most of that for us, going back to Freud, is unconscious. Um, so, um, so we have to be, without being obsessive about it, we have to be mindful about this all the time. You know? And it also is a source of information for us. You know? It's part of how we how we resonate and, and attune with with the person. Um, we we find that that different types of loss of attunement are the are the indicators that the limbic countertransference is not only present but but is present at a higher level. You know? And it happens to, to all therapists. It happens to all human beings when you lose your concentration, you know, or when you feel uncomfortable. Or you feel like you just want to leave, or you know you, you want this to be over, or all the different manifestations. Um, uh, you know, if you know it's ubiquitous and you know it's inevitable, okay, it it, it turns it it takes the the negative connotation away from countertransference, you know, and makes it part something that is part of the something that's organic and part of the organic process. Uh, and really, to be logical about it, who would want to sit down and, and hear another person talk about all kinds of horrible things that happened to them? Uh, you know, in a, in a very baseline kind of way. But but because we as therapists, you know, have aspired to uh, to more for in our lives and for ourselves and for the world, you know, uh, that's that's why we take on this challenge. Absolutely. Um, we're going to be affected by the people we meet um, and that might be unconscious and that may make us uncomfortable and all those other things and it may may bring real joy and awe for us as well at somebody's ability to survive as you said earlier as well and I, I find myself with both experiences and I just wonder I think in the earlier days you know Freud kind of saw countertransference as kind of a problem it kind of like muddied the waters and then with time, countertransference has been seen perhaps by, by some as more of a source of actual information or something that the therapist might be able to be mindful of and inquire into, and somehow that's somehow useful in the therapy. I'm just wondering, could you speak to that? Have you come across that side of... You know, of course. Hmm. Of course, but that's human. Hmm. You, know, uh, you know, in the human experience of of joys and failures and, and, and of, uh, of prevailing and, and, um, and of breaking down or being broken down. Um, it, it's all part of life. And what we deal with in therapy is all a part of life. That's, that's why not only should we depathologize it, we shouldn't let any concept uh, or, or, or whiff of pathologizing even be in the room. You know, that's that's why diagnosis has gone astray. Instead of it being helping us to understand what something is and where it comes from, it, it, it skews our our viewpoint of it. Um, but um, uh, it, you know, it's a bipersonal field to use a uh, an, an old term. You know, in in, in our lexicon, uh, and and it's and it's client affecting us and us affecting the client, you know, and going back to what I said, it's, it's, you know, on a, a co-equal sort of way. Um, so uh, the transference is not just to the client's issues, the transference is to us. And the counter transference is to the client just as their transference is, is to us. And it flows back and forth. And it is, it's natural. It's organic. Absolutely. And I know we, we use these kind of um, multisyllabic terms like countertransference for what is basically experiencing another person and them experiencing us. Um, and I suppose, you know, kind of brings me on to perhaps the last question I might ask, because I think we've covered so much here today, David, um, and we could do we could we could do so much more. But I get the sense that this way of working is 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 deeply satisfying for you, this 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 way of working and, and being as a therapist. And could you speak to that about, you know, how your journey has 
enriched your experience as a person and, and as a and as a clinician? I think that um, therapists are both born and made. You know, uh, speaking to you as a therapist, for myself, all the people that we know, all our colleagues, and then in uh, rippling concentric circles going going out from there. Um, uh, people who, but most people who become therapists have a capacity for empathizing with the experience of others, starting from before we had words and thoughts. You know, it's just part of, of who we are, part of our genetics, part of our, our energy, part of our destiny. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's like the three-year-old child who looks at another three-year-old child who's crying and who feels bad for them and wants them to feel better and wants to be able to do something to help them to feel better. That's, that's who we are. That's, that's where, where this, this comes from. So, um, to be able to, in a way that is progressively, uh, able to provide relief and healing and recovery for people who need it and deserve it, it's coming, you know, it, it, it's satisfying most of all to that core sense of, of, of who we are, you know, and to the origins of our evolution as, 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 a, as a being. Um, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of things that therapists don't say to each other, you know, uh, and one of the things that therapists don't say to each other is how frustrating it is to not be able to help people more or faster, you know? And that's from experienced, well-trained, effective therapists who are getting good results with the people who come for healing. Uh, we always want people to heal better. You know? um, and, and some of that is just, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of ego or, or something. Um, but a lot of that is, is that we have this inherent knowledge that of, of the incredible capacity for healing and recovery that human beings have. And the idea that we can help them to do it, no, no matter what it is, we can help them to do it, to do it better. Um, uh, so it's, but the satisfaction comes from um, just having it unfold in, in, in front of me. Uh, I, I say all the time, I see miracles happen every day with people that I'm with. And sometimes they're small miracles. And sometimes they're, you know, profound miracles. Um, right now with what's going on in, in, in the world with warfare and perpetration, uh, we can feel so helpful and so small and so inadequate. But, um, but what we do is actually you know, uh, making a difference. You know, for that person and for the generations that will follow that person and for for those those around those people so um, uh, it's it's you know it's a way to express that that essential empathy you know and and good wishes for others and to make a difference in this world while while things seem so you know, out of control and uh, discouraging uh, and I've been doing practice now for more than four decades, uh, and I still find it meaningful and, and uh, interesting and, and enjoyable as well as challenging. Wow, four decades, that's, that's a lot of experience. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I can resonate with so much of what you're saying there, David. And um, so I remember in my own training talking about like, you know, if our clients even knew like how deeply satisfying and amazing it can be for us, do you know, that, 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 that's sometimes the, the unspoken piece, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, um, if, if any of our viewers would like to know more about, you know, brain spotting and your work, um, I, we have the, we have, we mentioned the book, David, um, brain spotting, the revolutionary new therapy for rapid and effective change. Um, would you like to say anything about like what, what, where the next place somebody could go to, to find out more, uh, there's the book and. Well, my website, brainspotting.com, you know, has a lot of information. 
there's a YouTube video I made some years ago, uh, What is Brain Spotting, where I'm interviewed and, and I expand on it there. Um, uh, just just Google brain spotting and uh, a, a lot of stuff comes up and, uh, you know, you can some I, I love going down down the different pathways on, on the Internet. You know, so if you're that kind of person, there's a lot of pathways to go down. If you just want to be more focused, just go to brainspotting.com. My book is, you know, of course, it's on Amazon and you can buy it off my website. Um, uh, just, you know, it's, it's all out there. You know, it's there. For, it's there for the finding and there for the taking. Yeah, well, I'll certainly be, you know, looking into it much more now. And um, I found this absolutely fascinating. And yeah, it's very, very enriching. I love the, the openness uh, of the approach to the client, that kind of receptivity, responsiveness um is yeah isn't that essential experiential therapy i would say so yeah openness to the experience of self and other mm -hmm. um, and what unfolds so and curiosity and fascination absolutely absolutely so david look i just want to say thank you so much for coming here today and doing this interview um you know maybe we can do a follow-up at some stage if you're if you're open to that Absolutely. I, I would find that uh, very meaningful. Great. Me too. So with, with, with no further ado, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Vincent.